Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, this, um, as Manu already said, I'm from CSU in Fort Collins. We now, since last week, have a South Park episode named after our town. Um, yeah, some very basic things about this series of talks. First, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak, for the invitation. I'm very glad to be here. I am today still slightly jet-lagged. Apologies if I'm not sounding as coherent as I should be. Uh, it's a lecture series on computational group theory and the system gap, but it's not intended to be reading you the manual. There are a lot of things which are in the manual and which one can re-look up, and that doesn't really lend itself to the presentation about the system. So don't take this as everything will be in these slides. Essentially look at them as pointers to the manual. They are pointers to certain routines which are useful. What I'm planning to do is to put slides on the web after each talk on this web page, which I will give you at the end. Also, there are two P larger PDFs. One is a handbook which is called Abstract Algebra in GAP, which is an introduction to GAP intended for some, for a teacher who would teach a class on abstract algebra, but there is a lot of general stuff which is useful, and also lecture notes on computational group theory, which is more about the mathematics. If you do, can't understand me, I'm speaking with a somewhat weird accent, German and American mix. Please interrupt me if something is not clear or if I'm using formulations which, which are, are, seem to be weird. Also, if you have questions, ask questions. This is not intended as a highway where you barrel along without looking to a site. This is more a scenic tourist route with a lot of viewpoints. It is not that we need to reach one result at the end and otherwise everything was in vain. So don't be shy in asking questions and interrupt. Yeah. What am I planning to talk about? Today's talk mainly will be about gap and computational group theory in general. Then the next two lectures are in some way three com topics which you will see then why I combine them, orbits and stabilizers, permutation groups and finitely presented groups, then, and again, you will see why they are combined, matrix groups and higher level calculations in groups. And finally, I want to talk about, once we know more about the algorithms, about some standard things, how to do stuff in GAP, which I found over time have been, have been requested more than once, but are not obviously with a, with a single routine. Yeah, what do I assume? I assume you know basic undergraduate college mathematics. I'm not going to define what is a group, what is a homomorphism, and so on. I assume that you've done some basic programming. Again, just you know what a for loop is in some programming language. You know what a variable is, and so on. You know what a function calls. Groups, for me, always act on the right. And some textbooks do it exactly the other way around. Yes, this is unfortunate. But I will act on the right, so my permutations act on the right. My vectors are row vectors and so on. As I mentioned, I will give you, this is intended as pointers to the manual, but not intended to give you full manual definitions. There is also a little bit the question of bootstrapping. I will give you some examples at the start where I don't tell you much about what the computer does internally because that's a little bit more complicated. We'll find over time what the computer actually does. Yeah, what do I aim to convey with this class is that you will come out yeah, with some idea of what computational group theory software in particular, what GAP can do. How should you phrase your questions so that the computer can solve them effectively. You will have to do so. You will need to have some idea about the underlying algorithms, what actually happens internally, what things can be done to help with performance or with memory use, a little bit how you can interface with GAP. 
Yeah, so let's, let's start with the first topic. This is about gaps and computational group theory. What is computational group theory? That's the study of algorithms for solving problems from group theory. And you can look at it in two ways. You can look at it on the one hand side from theory. What is theoretically possible to do? What's the complexity of doing certain calculations? This has a lot of connections to theoretical computer science, in particular the P versus NP problems. And just at the end of last year, there has been the famous result by Babai about graph isomorphism, which essentially says, and what needs to be done to solve it completely is a problem about group isomorphism. And so the ball there is in the court of group theory. However, my talks will be concerned mainly with the practical side, concrete calculations, how can one do them, how can one do them effectively, and these concrete calculations are there for experiments, for study of examples, for dealing with smaller cases. If you do things on the computer, computers always need finite things. So we will have some infinite groups coming up, but there always will be some kind of finiteness condition which actually makes calculations feasible on the computer. Um, on the other hand, I also should say these are intended as mathematics talks, not as software engineering talks. There is, in the end, a lot of software engineering aspects in making algorithms work effectively. Uh, but I basically won't go there. But if you're interested in that, or in particular, if you have started programming and you ran run into issues where you feel now it needs software engineering, I'm happy to talk about this on an individual basis. Yeah, what is computational group theory used for? I mentioned already it's concrete calculations in concrete groups. The main uses have been to study examples find out how do things seem to behave, which can lead to conjectures, which one can then hopefully prove. Often it has been quite interesting to just run through libraries of groups in small, of, with small parameters, small order, small degree, or so to just see how does some conjecture behave. There are, if you go more to the side of writing proofs, Often proofs have some base cases or small cases. Well, small for the proof because it's not all numbers, but small might still be quite big, where the general proof method doesn't work and where one needs an ad hoc argument. The calculation often can settle this easily. Uh, of course, if you apply group theory, people from areas of application might not really care that much about proofs, but they have a concrete group and they want a result there, and they might be happy with the calculation. What I also want to emphasize is there is no general solve my problem function, where you just write out what is your problem, and the computer will try to be clever. Basically, to solve problems effectively, you need to know some things about the underlying algorithms because otherwise it's very easy to fall into the trap of some generic method which will never terminate in your lifetime. Yeah, GAP, which stands for Groups, Algorithms, and Programming. It's open source software for computational group theory. There also is a program called Magma, which I basically won't mention after this. In Maple, there is a little bit, but not really not very much. It's available, for example, on www.gapsystem.org. You can download it from there. I also have it on a memory stick here if somehow the network connection doesn't work well. In the first practical session, we will install it. Well, you will install it on your machines, but I'll be around to help you with doing so. If you're interested at some point to get more involved with software development, the source is on GitHub uh, under GAP systems. Gap. It's software which originally was developed in a Unix environment, and a lot of its behavior still is inherited from there. But we have a Windows version. Yes, it looks clearly in a way that it can't deny its Unix heritage, but it works there. First releases came around 1990. Current version is 4.8.5 from September. And 
it has been this initially the, it has been designed both as a tool for concrete calculation and also as a test bed for implementations uh, trying out new algorithms. It has been cited by now over 2,000 times in refereed papers. Uh, there is a mailing list gap forum which you can find about on the, these web pages. Also, if you have questions, a good source is if you go to Math Stack Exchange and you use the gap tag, several of the people involved with the system are monitoring this and you are likely, and as well the mailing list, you're likely to get an answer there. It's an interpreted language. So it consists of a kernel, which is written in C. That kernel provides this interpreted language and provides time critical functions, but most of the code is actually written in the gap language. Why that? Because for programs, there is a 10, 90% or 20, 80% um, phenomenon. Most of the runtime spent by a calculation is spent as a in a very small part of the code. And so if you optimize the 10% of your code, which actually spend 90% of the runtime, you will be far. You're, this, this is worth doing, it, but there is no need to try to get all the code running fast because it doesn't contribute much time. And by having it as an interpreted language, it makes work debugging, developing much easier. I should mention, though, I will not go into this in my talks, it is possible to compile gap to C, but essentially just for the purpose to load these C routines into gap sessions, and don't overestimate the success. If you just compile plainly into C, you will see 2%, 3% runtime improvement, and that is basically because the interpreted language is not typed and all calls still go into generic function dispatch. So what you want then would need to do is really start looking at what other data types to improve some of the function calls. Also, GAP is part of the software which the system Sage calls. I haven't used it that way, but one can call it from Sage, but I don't really know details there. And as part of this, there exists a library which allows to call gap from C programs. Again, I haven't used this, but be aware that it exists if you ever wanted to do that. There also is a very substantial library of contributed packages for gap. And in some of the talks, I think we will hear later about some of these packages. Some of the packages need to be loaded explicitly, and you do so in gap by simply saying load package and then a string with the name of the package. Yeah, let's start looking at a very basic example. How do you interact with a system? You start the system and it prompts you for the input. It writes this gap, greater sign, which is the prompt to type in your input. You type in the command, you end with a semicolon, and gap will print out what this command returns. So for example, I can ask for the size, well, you also could type order, but size is the generic gap function for how large is some object, and that object might not have an algebraic structure, it could be just a list, so that's why it's size. Um, if in some cases routines return tons of stuff, and you can do use a double semicolon, to suppress this printing to, to avoid messing up your screen. Uh, the printing is sometimes trying to be a nice way. So for the symmetric group, this gets displaced in this way, and but you can't immediately type it in that way. This is just so that if you read it, you have quickly an idea what is the thing, and you don't spend, if you write out symmetric group and it comes in longer things, it, use a lot of screen space. Um, yeah, your commands can be assignments, which assign two variables. Any string which is not a declared function or so would be a potential variable in gap. And 
it will still give the value of that assignment. Uh, yeah, so for example, we could define a group, here's a metric group on 14 letters, 14 symbols. We can ask for a two pseudo subgroup of gap. Yes, there are several of them. If you look at the manual for pseudo subgroup, it will tell you in detail, pseudo subgroup will give you one representative. It doesn't guarantee which one. It could be if you call it different times for the same group. When creating the group anew, you could have different representatives. So there is a lot of details of the implementation which then really are in the manual. Um, yeah, and there are variables last and last two, which give you the last respectively the second to last prior result if you forgot, oh, sorry, if you forgot to assign it to a variable. Yeah, if you have longer input, it is quite likely that you might want to change it or you have initially mistakes in it which you want to fix. So there is a option read file name, which reads in a file. This needs to be a plain text file, not a doc word document or so. Uh, and a little bit more about this on the next slide. Uh, yeah, so we file with a sequence of commands, for, or this sequence of commands could be just a function definition, uh, which gap will read in and execute. And if there are mistakes in there, you just can read in the file again without having to type in a long function definition. There is an online version of the manual which you can access with a question mark question mark string will give you the manual section which is titled with that string. If you want to search for keywords in the manual, you can use a double question mark and then the keyword, and it will give you the options. If it's unique, it just gives you the section, otherwise it tells you which sections could apply there. There is a function log to, and again you give a file name, which will produce a transcript of your, section, of your session in the system, if you want to look later back at what did you actually do and what were the results, this is a text file where you can look into. There are functions print to and append to to print data specifically to a file. There is also an option with a function save workspace, which will save a gap workspace. This is the current state of the system. So you could save the state of the system reboot your computer for whatever reason, well, probably because your system administrator told you that some update was due, and start gap, load the work workspace and be back at the same stage. Loading the workspaces can be a little bit tricky under Windows because by default this is done by a command, by a command line parameter for loading. Uh, Saved workspaces are specifically to the platform on which GAP is installed and the version of GAP. If you update GAP in between, your workspace likely will not lay load properly. If you run it on a Windows machine and you try to use the workspace later on a Mac, it likely will not work. This is really specific to, or if you change from a 32-bit GAP to a 64-bit GAP or so, this will not work. These are specifically there, well, and since at some point, even in such a nice program as GAP, you might be fed up with it, you can leave the program. You do so by typing quit semicolon or by typing control D. Yeah. Well, with files, so I told you about reading in files, printing to files. Where are these files? By default, these files are in the directory where you started GAP. Well, that's under Unix, this is pretty obvious. You are, have a command line, you type gap to start it, and that's the place where you are. Under Windows, this is not immediately obvious where, or it could be the folder where the gap binary sits and you might not want to write there, so you need to give a full path. With the Unix, Unix heritage of gap, that path has to be given in a Unix style and it actually uses part of the Cygnus environment which we 
used to compile GAP under Windows. So if you want to put something in your my, well, if I want to put, if I have had a Windows installation and I wanted to put it into my, the, my, my documents folder, it could be SIG drive and it's forward slashes because of the Unix heritage, even though Windows uses backslashes. SIG drive C, which would stand in place of the C colon, users, my name, and then my documents. That, of course, is horrible to type in. So there is an option there are, uh, is a function directory home, which gives you the name of that directory. And you can use file name with a directory name and then the file name, which will produce that file name. And you could use log to f or read f or so. So this is the shortest way under, or the most convenient way under Windows to access files which are in a specific folder. There also should be directory desktop to access the desktop. If you use Windows, be aware, the default setup of Windows does not be show file suffixes. So if you create a text file under Windows, myfile.txt, Windows might just show it under the name my file. But the real name is with a .txt, and you need to give that nay, that .txt suffix there. So if you created the file, reading doesn't work, check whether somewhere, whether you might need to add this, this suffix for reading in the file. OK. So that's the basic things about just sitting on the computer and typing to the system. Let's talk a bit more what the system can do and what its objects are. So the basic objects are numbers, integers, rational numbers, cyclotomic numbers. They are Booleans. And fail is also a Boolean. We have three Booleans. Why, why do we have fail as a Boolean? Because there are certain situations where the answer, where the computer might say, I can't do that calculation, or your question doesn't make sense. So for example, if you have a list of objects and you ask, you have the list one, two, three, four, and you ask, at what position is the object number five? It will say fail, it's not in there. And there are some situations where you really want to preserve false as a variable, and therefore, this fail exists as a separate object. There are finite field elements built in as objects, permutations, some composed objects, records, and lists. Lists are basically used for to represent anything which is in some way could be considered as a list, as a sequence of objects. Sets are represented as lists. Vectors are represented as lists. Matrices are lists of vectors. The reason for this is that this way you don't need to forcefully convert between lists and sets just because you want to do an inherently set operation like in but your object is a list. There are also objects which one can build from lists and records, and more about this in the last lecture. Um, and groups or words in abstract generators are built that way. They look like new objects on their own, but internally they actually build on these data types. Any non-reserved string is a variable. You assign with colon equal to variables. Yep stores lists as pointers. Well, there is a slight, if it's small integers, it's not a pointer, but there is no harm in considering it as a pointer. So a list will have in every entry internally a pointer to the object. and The object then is stored in another place. Why is this important? Because if you're, you change the object, which is in the list, and another place points to that same object, it changes in both places. So in the computer science ling lingo, 
This means so the list, and the same happens with function calls. They are called by reference, not called by variable. It is possible because you can cause quite harm with this if you do so to protect objects from modification, but we don't need to. There is a programming language which falls broadly in the Algol family. Well, I don't know anyone who nowadays still uses Algol, but if you've used Pascal, Java, Python, it's, it's this kind of language. It's an interpreted language. There is a break loop which allows you to inspect the variables where the program, uh, at the point when it stopped or ran into an error, and that just, at least I found this to be a god's end for debugging, trying out how do things behave. Uh, because the objects are quite complicated sometimes, and if you only had a GNU debugger to work on the C level, this could be horrible to do. Yeah. I mentioned this break loop. It's worth briefly talking about this. So. If the, your routine or your call runs into an error, this could be an error in gap, it could be inconsistent parameters, it could be even you're running out of memory, gap will give the error message and then the prompt will change, it will change from gap to BRK greater. So at this point, you could look if you access variables, at this point the scope is the scope of variables is the scope of the current local function. So you can look at local variables which you are of the function which you otherwise can't. You could type where and then the level how long backtrace you want to see exactly at what point in the call stack you are. By default, it calls, it prints immediately where five, the last five calls, but if you're very deep in a function, you might need to type this to see it all. You could force this prompt by typing control C for interrupt. If you have a long calculation, no idea what is happening, you can type control C and it will tell you where it is and you could see what, what is it actually doing at the moment. Well, of course, you don't want to stay in this break loop. You want to get out and you get out of it exactly the same way how you get out of gap, namely typing quit semicolon or typing control D. If you write your own functions and you actually want the possibility to trigger an error, there is a function error in the language and then a string or variables. This is like print, which will display that information and then go into the break. Yeah, I may set already anything which is any collection of objects which is not an algebraic structure basically is represented by something which looks like a list. Sets, vectors, matrices, Boolean lists. There are different ways how lists are stored internally. Not all lists are stored in the same way. So if you have the range from, say, the range from 1 to 10 to the, make it 64 bits, 10 to the 60. This is not stored by 10 to the 60 entries. This is stored by storing the number one, the step with one, and the end number. So there are ways, many ways how GAP can store particular lists in an efficient way, but all the basic operations, entry, list access, length of a list, position, always work in the same way so your function doesn't need to worry about how the list is represented. Yet will not automatically store a list in the most efficient form imaginable. It tries to be reasonably intelligent, but it doesn't try to be artificially intelligent. And so it might be necessary to convert lists into a particular format to make sure they're stored in the best way. Lists can grow arbitrarily large. Well, arbitrarily, oh yeah, I mentioned to you, you might need to help Gap how to, how to store them. Arbitrarily actually means they can be, an ordinary list can be up to size, oh, not 10, two, sorry, this should be two to the B minus four, where B is the bitness of the system, 32 bit or 64 bit, how you compiled Gap, but, 
apart from that, they can grow arbitrary large. Yep, we'll do the memory management internally to allocate memory. You don't need to bother with this. It has a garbage collection which throws away objects which are don't need it anymore. Lists also can have unbound entries. In some situations, this is convenient. Be aware, however, that the unbound entries still take memory space for the location. Yeah. Since lists are represented, also used to represent sets, there is the standard way how mathematicians represent objects. So, for example, if we have a set, we might want to say we want those integers a, which lie between 1 and 10, where, I don't know, a square is equal to, well, let's make it a non-empty set. Right, you all know this notation. So there are functions in GAP which allow you to simulate this mathematical notation and build objects accordingly. And what these functions basically do is they loop over a list and either take those elements of a list which satisfy a property or apply something to all the elements in the list. List runs over a list and applies a function to all elements in that list. Filtered returns the objects in a list which satisfy a property, so for which a function returns true. Number just counts how many there are for all tests, whether something is true for all elements in the list, for any, if it's true for one element in the list, these are basically the existence quanters, and, and for all quanter, quanters, first gives the first element in a list, position property gives the first, the position on in a list where a certain property is fulfilled. They all take this function, then a list, and so the name, list, open parenthesis, the list over which you want to do it, comma, and then a function. And these functions may be given in what is sometimes called lambda syntax. If, because it's a one parameter function, you can write x minus greater, which is supposed to be an arrow, and then some expression in x. So if I wanted to do this kind of notation in gap, what I would say is, I want filtered from the list 1 to 10. And then what do I want to filter? I want that a goes to a square is 9. Of course, you know what this is. You wouldn't this particular calculation, but that gives you the gap syntax for translating it. And what is nice by Iterating these calls, you can do quite complicated function calls or quite things which would need already writing a function, or you can put it almost in one line and for easy prototyping, this is quite nice. This is not necessarily the most efficient way to search hard, to solve hard problems, but if your problem is not too big, the computer might just solve it still quite quickly and you're done without much having to write. So, for example, what I want to do here is I want to f give you an example, finding all Carmichael numbers up to 2,000. What is a Carmichael number? Sometimes it's called a pseudo prime to any base. You know from Fermat's little theorem that if P is prime, then A to the P is congruent to A modulo p. Well, so if you have that a to the p is not congruent to a modulo p, you know that p is not a prime. And that can be used for testing primality. It turns out, even if you choose different a's, there are numbers which for all possible bases satisfy this, even if Numbers p, which are not prime, but this is fulfilled for all numbers a smaller than p. And these numbers are called Carmichael numbers. So that's what I want to do here. I want numbers. OK, I take the numbers up to 2,000, and I filter those which are not prime. Because prime satisfied, but I want those which are not prime. So 
This filtered command gives me a list of all the numbers from 2 to 2,000, which are not prime. And now I want, from those numbers, again filtered, I want to select some of them. And what do I want? <coughs> I want to take all numbers for each such number n. I want to take all numbers from 2 to n minus 1, which have GCD1 with that number. And I want that for all of these numbers, I, B, I have that B to the n minus 1 modulo n is congruent to 1. Well, GAP doesn't have a congruent operator, but it has mod as a binary operator. So I want B to the n minus 1 mod n is equal to 1. Small remark aside, if you've ever programmed with modulo and powers, the way I've written it here, I'm first calculating b to the n minus 1 and then reduce modulo. You all know that's not the efficient way of doing it. The efficient way is to reduce in between, and there is a function power mod which would do this. I've just written it here in this form to have it slightly shorter on the screen. And what it does is it returns me the numbers up to uh, 2,000, the Carmichael numbers, five, and that takes about and seconds or so on a laptop. Uh, 561, 1,105, and 1,729. Well, since we are in a lecture room named in honor of Ramanujan, I should mention 1,729 is a very prominent number, and you all, I'm sure, have heard the story. Yeah, some general conventions about the gap language. L operations which come with a standard gap library named in uppercase with infix upper letters. If it's multiple words, so it would be silo subgroup with a big S also here. It, the function, and it is, if the function specifies uh, how something is done, it comes afterwards, so group homomorphism by images, the naming of the parts is, uh, of the arguments, is intended to be in decreasing size or in decreasing magnitude, which is very vague. It's just if you have a group and a group element, it would be first as arguments. It would be first the group and then the group element. It would not be the other way around. So if a function took a group, a permutation, and a point, it would come in that ordering by default convention. And I'm sure by a brief search, you will find examples in the library where this is not satisfied. But that, that's the basic idea. There are things which are called attributes. <coughs> For example, size is an attribute that store information about objects. So if you have a group, you ask for its size the first time, gap thinks a while to calculate it. The next time the result is there immediately because it has stored the result. Um, these attributes, one can check whether they are known, one can set them, and in some situations this is good. This will help in substantially with performance by telling gap about certain properties of objects. If Possible gap returns only classes of objects, and one would call representative on this. So, for example, by default, you would not, well, there is also function elements, but you would not ask for all the elements of a group, but only the conjugacy classes, or there isn't a function which gives you all subgroups. It, there is just a function which gives you the conjugacy classes of subgroups. And then one can call representative on one of these classes to get the concrete subgroup. Yeah, some useful functions for working with groups. At the start, just to have, have an idea. Group and a list of genera or generators, or just generator, comma, generator, comma, generator, creates a group, subgroup creates a subgroup, random gets a random element from the group random up to the quality of gaps built in pseudo-random generator. If that was perfect, this would return a perfect equal distribution on the group. Um, centralizer, 
normalizer of a subgroup, conjugacy classes of elements, lists of classes, and they store a representative and a centralizer. Similarly, conjugacy classes, subgroup. There is a function which at least I found quite useful, intermediate subgroups. This gives you all subgroups between a group S and a group T. If you've ever tried this on a larger example, you found that it's lousily slow. Well, in the next release, next major release, this will be less lousy. This is something which recently got improved. Normal subgroups, maximal subgroups, again, we don't, you probably don't want all of them, but you want them up to conjugacy. And there a function is, there is conjugacy classes, maximal subgroups, or maximal subgroup class reps, which gives lists of representatives of the maximal subgroups. Uh, complement classes representatives, complements to a normal subgroup. If you <coughs> have multiple groups and you ask what are they, how are they related, there is a function isomorphism groups. Again, this will be substantially improved in the next major release, which finds an isomorphism between two groups if one exists or it returns fail, so if they're not isomorphic, one of the users a fail. If the groups are not too large, there is a function it group which gives an identification number in the library of small groups. If you have a group of order 192 and you want to use it in a paper, what has been done now for quite a few years that people basically say it's group number so-and-so in that library and that numbering is uh, will, is guaranteed to stay stable. So even if in 100 years someone looks at the paper with that number, they know exactly what group it is and that this is a very compact way of telling someone about a specific group. There is also a function G quotients, which takes a group G and look at the group H and it finds all homomorphisms from G to H up to kernels being equal. So this finds possible factor groups. There is a function structure description, which should come with a big warning. So this works perfectly fine if you put in the hydro group of order A. And it tries to give a name to a group. But if you've looked a little bit into construction of groups, you will see immediately that a lot of groups really have in some way the same construction name simply because direct product, semi-direct product, and so on. There are so many ways to form semi-direct products that you will potentially get a lot of groups. <coughs> so if your groups get bigger, this might not be unique. It might take very long. It, it looks initially like a very cool function, but really be aware that it is severely limited in its, in its scope. Yeah, let's look at a basic example. Let's say we were asked how many subgroups of M11, you've heard in the last lecture what M11 is, are isomorphic to A5. And this is just to have a toy example I can construct easily. This is not necessarily the fastest or the best way of answering this, but just to show you some functionality. I'm constructing the mature group as a group by, generated by two permutations. There is also a function mature group, but I wanted to show you the group command. I take the symmetric group as five, take its derived subgroup. Indeed, I could immediately have called alternating group of five, but I wanted to show you this. Um, I calculate the conjugacy classes of subgroups of M11, take their representatives. There are 39 classes, so I now have 39 subgroups. I take those which have the same order as A5. There are two of them. I ask, are they both simple? Yes, they both are. So simple group of order 60, they must be A5. I can ask GAP, for example, to find isomorphisms from these subgroups to A5. I can ask if I go from M11 to S11, are these two subgroups conjugate? No, they are not. Otherwise, this would return a conjugating permutation, but here it returns fail, so they're not conjugate. Um, and I can, if I want to know how many subgroups are there in total, these are not just these two, but those which are conjugate. So 
I call sum, and sum also takes works like the list functions, run over this list of length two, and for every subgroup x, calculate the index of its normalizer in G, and sum them up, that gives me 198, so M11 has 198 subgroups which are isomorphic to A1. Yeah, some more things about how to get into agreement with the system. GAP is a very good bureaucrat. It will only give you results that are correct. This is subject to well program errors. Of course, we don't have any bugs in GAP. But, well, there are, there are errors. There also could be computer errors. You could have cosmic rays flipping a bit in memory. Chance is very small, but that in principle that could be. Subject also to publication level research. Typically this would be refereed research, but that includes the classification of the finite simple groups. So if you're doing calculations with GAP implicitly, you're assuming the classification. In most cases this doesn't matter, but if you're suspicious about the classification and you want to verify things, you might need to be slightly careful what commands you use in a calculation. Results all returned always are true, even if random methods are used. In these cases, a verification step will follow. Yep also will aim to answer all the questions which have been posed to it, if it can at all even if it means that it enumerates all elements of a huge group, exceeding all the memory you have, or starts a calculation which will not finish in any of our grandchildren's lifetime, even if it brings a multi-user machine to its knees. Well, that's, that, that can be rather awkward to, to have someone else's machine crash because you gave GAP a question and it tried to answer and just went the wrong way. So what GAP will do by default is it will call give an error message if a certain error memory limit, and by default this is two gigabytes, is exceeded. And this is just to avoid these problems that you have a machine which does also other things. It might be your desktop machine on which you were just composing an email that a GAP job doesn't allocate so much resources that the machine can't work. If you get such an error, uh, you can just type return. Yeah, so what you can do with this error, you can change the limit by a startup option. If the error message comes, you can just type return. Then the limit is doubled and the calculation continues. But at this point, you might want to look at what is GAP doing? Is it a sensible thing to do? If you look in the backtrace and somewhere has as list or elements or so of your group at the very start, that might not be a clever thing to do if your group has order 10 to the 50. You might want to think, is there a chance that this particular calculation has it, is actually able to complete, but you can continue if it really, if you have a bona fide calculation which needs more, you could change that memory limit or you just should, could continue. Yep, also, like a good bureaucrat, will not trust automatically all user input, but will perform certain sanity checks. Does the element really lie in the group? Is the mapping on generators really a homomorphism and return fail or trigger an error if this is not true? This is to avoid for a careless user falling into traps, calling a cal calculation, amazing result, and it turns out because the input was wrong. Sometimes these tests can take substantial time, which you don't want to spend. So in particular, if this is in a loop, so certain operations have a very variant which where the name ends with NC for no check, which skips the tests. And that can be used in situations where the context makes it clear that you have valid parameters given. Vice versa, dually, there is the option to put assertions in your code to actually have extra tests being done and interrupt if something behaves inconsistently. Um, with this talk, for some reason, this talk was listed as a full hour and not 50 minutes. What is the intention? Okay, okay, so I, 
Okay, so I, if you want, I have 10 more minutes. <laughs> or are you very hungry? You're very hungry. Okay, <laughs> so we'll continue with that next time. And let me just, oh yeah, no, this might be a bit more. Let me just finish with this slide, which gives you the link where I will post the talk slides and where you also can find these lecture notes, which I mentioned before. In principle, this should work with a cell phone to give you the link without typing, but yeah. Thank you very much, and I'll see you this afternoon in the tutorial and when we will install GAP and look at some basic calculations. Thank you.